there's a continual battle between those who want to keep data private and those that want to break in. We can't lazily use bad encryption and call it secure. Imagine if your bank secured their records with the Caesar cipher. So in this video, we're going to look at ciphers and how they work, so we can get some understanding on what is secure and what isn't. An algorithm is a set of instructions that explains how something is done. A cipher is an algorithm that is used to encrypt information. This means that a cipher is the process that takes plain text and converts it to ciphertext. There are a lot of different ciphers out there. Some are quite old and some are relatively new. Some are similar and some have a very unique approach. For this reason, we will sometimes use a combination of ciphers depending on the task. Given enough time though, flaws are found in ciphers. This can lead to them being known as insecure. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they've been broken, but due to a vulnerability that has been found, it's only a matter of time. A cipher is just a way to encrypt data, and the way they work is usually very well known. It's like a lock on the door of your house. The security behind this comes with the key. The cipher, along with the secret key, is what makes our data secure. Keys are essentially a large number. Keys come in different sizes, with larger keys being more secure. Think of a combination lock with three rotating disks, each numbered 0 through 9. This allows for 1000 different combinations. If you know the right combination, you can open the lock. If you don't know it, you either have to break the lock, or guess your way through each combination. If you tried a new combination every second, you could go through them all in less than 17 minutes. That's not really that long to break in, especially considering that you likely wouldn't have to try all 1000 before finding the right one. But what if you had 4 discs instead of 3? We now have 10,000 different combinations, which will take over 2.5 hours to go through. The lock is like our cipher, and each combination is one possible key. Larger keys means more possible combinations, which means better security. A small key might be 64 bits long. That's over 18 quintillion different key combinations. And apparently that's called 18 trillion if you're from Europe. That's more than twice the grains of sand in the entire world. 128 bit numbers are astronomically bigger. Every bit we add doubles the key size. So while you think 128 bit is double the size of a 64 bit key, it's really much, much bigger. This is 340 undecillion. This is around 340 trillion times more than the estimated number of stars in the known universe. And then we have 256 bit numbers. I'm not even going to try to work out the name for a number this big. I'm just going to say that this is larger than all the atoms in the entire perceivable universe. With this many key combinations, trying to find the right one through brute force is nearly impossible. A cipher like AES, which is a very common cipher today, will typically use either 128 or 256 bits for its key size. Either is fine, but 256 is considered more secure. Other algorithms, like RSA, use massive keys. You thought 256 bit was big? Right now, RSA keys are typically using 2048 bit keys, and they can go bigger. We'll talk about why those keys are so big in the next video. You might remember that I said that the DES cipher was insecure. This was mainly due to its key size of only 56 bits, and that's way too small by today's standards. Back in 1998, when I was still in high school, a group called the Electronic Frontier Foundation built a supercomputer called Deep Crack for about $250,000. It could figure out your DES key in about four and a half days. They estimated that for one million, they could build a machine that could do it in under a day. And that was 20 years ago. Imagine what they could do now. These type of ciphers can be broken into two categories, stream ciphers and block ciphers. A block cipher will take the plain text information and it will break it into specially sized blocks and encrypt each one. We'll have a better look at this soon. 
Stream ciphers, on the other hand, don't need to break up the plain text before encrypting it. Instead, using the secret key, a stream cipher will create a special piece of information called a one-time pad, or OTP. The one-time pad is essentially a large number that looks random. It will be the same size as the piece of information that needs to be encrypted. A stream cipher will then use a simple function like exclusive or to combine the two, resulting in cipher text. You may not have heard of exclusive or before, and that's okay, because I'll give you a really quick overview. Exclusive or, or XOR, is a simple logic function that combines the individual bits in two numbers together, and that results in a third different number. If you want to try it out, you can do it on a Windows calculator for yourself. The interesting part is, XOR is reversible. If you have any two of these three numbers, you can use XOR to find the third. A stream cipher will use the plain text as one of these values, and the one time pad as the other. XORing them together creates the cipher text. When decrypting, we can use the key to generate the same one time pad. We also have the cipher text, so if we then XOR them together, we will get the original plain text. Keep in mind that the XOR function itself does not provide the encryption. The real encryption comes from generating the one time pad, which can be done with the secret key. Stream ciphers have an advantage. Each byte of plain text is encrypted by a different part of the one time pad, and this makes it very unlikely that anyone will find any patterns in the cipher text that they could then use to break the encryption. The downside is that large amounts of data require the use of a very large one time pad, which can use up a lot of memory. Also, stream ciphers use regularly changing keys in order to regularly change the one time pad. Distributing these keys can be difficult to do securely. If you're interested in learning more about stream ciphers, I recommend looking into the RC4 cipher. It's quite old and it is very insecure, but as a learning tool, it can be quite useful. For everything we've been talking about, I can also recommend a good book called Network Security, Private Communication in a Public World. It's getting a bit old itself, but it does still explain the concepts really well. I'll put a link in the description if you'd like to have a look. Block ciphers are generally more common than stream ciphers today. The original data is broken into fixed size blocks, typically 64, 128 or 256 bits long, and each block is encrypted individually. The way each block is handled is called the mode of operation. The simplest mode is electronic code book, or ECB. This mode simply breaks the data into blocks and then uses the cipher to encrypt each block with the same secret key. Nothing fancy at all. And decryption is just as simple. Each block is decrypted with the same key, and then the blocks are reassembled together in the right order. Makes a lot of sense, right? Unfortunately, this has a critical flaw. What if two blocks of plain text are the same? Then these two blocks of cipher text will also look the same. And this can give the bad guys some clues around how to break the encryption. This is similar to the flaw in the Caesar cipher that we saw in the last video. So although it's simple, ECB is not really used in practice. Another mode of operation called cipher block chaining attempted to resolve the flaw in ECB. Before any encryption is done, a random number is generated. This is known as the initialization vector, or IV. The first block is XORed with the IV, and then the result is encrypted using the secret key. The second block is then XORed with the result of the first block, and then it is encrypted. This process is repeated with all remaining blocks making each block reliant on the block before it. So even if sections of the plain text are the same, the cipher text will look different. This is similar to the Enigma cipher which we saw in the last video. For decryption, we start by decrypting the last block. We can then XOR this with the previous block to gain the plain text block. This can be repeated until all blocks are decrypted and the original message can be reassembled. All good now? No, not quite. There are still some complicated weaknesses in CBC, so there are a few other modes of operation. They're all similar to CBC in some respects, but a bit more secure. Unfortunately, they're also far more complicated. Some modes will use a small one-time pad to make the block cipher behave a little like a stream cipher. These include output feedback mode, cipher feedback mode, and counter mode. But right now the one to use is GCM. It's very fast and it's very secure. Everything we've talked about so far is reversible. 
That is, we can encrypt some data and we can then decrypt it again. Would it surprise you then to learn that there is a type of encryption that works in only one direction? That is, it cannot be decrypted. One-way encryption is also known as a hash algorithm, a message digest, or a one-way transformation. But what you call it's not really all that important in your mind right now, is it? What you want to know is why would we ever want any kind of encryption that cannot be reversed? Well, I'm going to make you wait a little bit. Before we look at why, we need to look at how. A hashing algorithm takes a message of any length, and from this, it computes a short fixed length value. This message is called the hash, and it is a way to represent the original message. If we were to change even a single bit of the original, the hash would change completely. Common hash algorithms include MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-256. As we're producing a fixed length number, we're going to lose a lot of information. That is, we simply can't have all the information from the original message encoded into the hash value. And that's why no one can decrypt a hash. It simply is impossible, as the hash does not contain enough information. So now back to the original question, why would we ever want to do this? It's surprisingly useful for a few different things. You may have seen this when downloading certain files from the internet. Take this Ubuntu download as an example. Once we're finished downloading, we can generate the hash of the file it should match what's been listed here. If it doesn't, the file may not have downloaded correctly. If we're sending a message, it's important that the message has not been tampered with. Put simply, we could calculate the hash of the message before it's sent, and send it along with the message itself. The receiver, once they have the message, can also generate a hash and compare it to the senders. This is often called a message authentication code or a message integrity code, depending on the exact way it's used. A third use is for storing passwords. It's a bad idea to store passwords in plain text, just in case someone steals a password database. So instead, we could generate hashes of the passwords and store them instead. This would be secure, as they can't be reversed, and therefore, no one could steal the passwords. Whenever someone enters their password, the computer generates the hash from what they entered, which is then compared to the hash in the password database. Of course, it, it's going to be a little bit more complicated than that, but you get the general idea. In this video, we talked about a type of encryption called symmetric encryption. But there's another type called asymmetric encryption, and you use it far more than you realize. It is critical to modern security, and we will discuss why and how it works in part three. And I hope to see you there.